So yeah, the title of this talk is Beyond Objection Fraction, Assessment of LB Function. So yeah, I thought just talking about our objectives here, we're talking about key principles of measuring heart, heart function, the different methods that are available, some which are available now, some which will be more available in the future, and some which are available more so in cardiology, and looking at combining data uh, in assessment of function that includes stroke volume and cardiac output. And, you know, as we know, critical in this, the LV plays a pretty uh, heavy role, whether it's a cause for um, disease or a consequence of disease. Um, but we know that low ejection fraction, for example, is a predictor of mortality to epic shock patients. Um, and we know it plays an important role in how we manage things like inotropes and vasopressors and our more advanced forms of therapy. Um, interestingly, things like a hyperdynamic ventricle is also associated with high short-term mortality, which often this is thought to be either a normal or kind of a normal response to a state. This can actually, uh, like I said, be a risk factor for high mortality. Um, and I think the real problem is, is it un, it's really unclear what measures of heart function actually reflect the true reality of heart function in ICU. Out of all the imaging, we can look at the heart left, right, and center, but the truth is we may entirely miss what's actually going on and what the heart is actually doing from a performance standpoint. Um, so I would argue that it's really just, it, it's kind of an abstract concept because, you know, we have all these imaging modalities, but we really don't know necessarily what they always mean, especially when you're on, you know, a dozen different inotropes and pressors and you've you know given six liters of fluid and you have gram negative sepsis and it's normal or hyperdynamic it's unclear how to interpret that um measures of heart function have evolved over time and uh, but i mean ef is large one that's been cited and i often have learners ask like this is the first or our second question which the the ef um is important in select states it's not important in all states necessarily or as important as other measures um, but it's certainly one that gets often most cited. And it's one that gets most often confused with, with actual heart function or cardiac output. And this can lead to errors in diagnosis, referrals, and therapeutics. Patients with, for example, a depressed ejection fraction from a chronic cardiomyopathy who's referred for, you know, a, like a, a acute heart dysfunction, for example, or even thought to be an acute ischemic event with a heart that's been chronically, um, you know, exposed to either toxins or a cardiomyopathy, for example. So historically, they were often linear methods. So things, for example, where, where M-mode was used. M-mode was one of the first techniques used in ultrasound. And so it was very easy to look it down and, and begin to understand which uh, which structures represented which. For example, here's the interceptal wall. Okay, we can see the valve here. We look a little further. We can see the, the, um, infero, um, oh, the, the, the infralateral wall. Um, and looking at the, the dimensions of systole versus diastole, and trying to compare what effectively is what's called fractional shortening is, is how much is cavity changes in diastole versus systole. And historically, this was used in different methods, either the, the uh, Tychols or Quinones method to basically tr transform this into an ejection fraction. You know, while this was, you know, mathematical and, and at the time uh, very cool and done for many, many years, uh, it's now really no longer recommended because obviously it's a single dimension um, and has a lot of limitations like Regional, regional wall motion abnormalities and just the overall shape and position of that M mode. So that's kind of off the table. There's been other methods that have been kind of investigated, one called MAPSI, which is like CAPSI, but with an M, um, which is, yeah, of course, a little little switch there of a, of a consonant. <laughs> but basically what this looks at is we know that the LV shortens during systole. So if you look at the lateral um, portion of the lateral annulus of the, of the mitral valve, how much that shortens from the base to the apex. Okay, and we know that typically it's kind of 1.2 to 1.5 centimeters, less than eight millimeters associated with a drop in LV function. And this is just a, a more or less, I guess, more so binary indicator of whether there's a high probability of LV dysfunction. Again, you can imagine that this is going to be problematic if you have regional wall motion abnormalities. Okay, and again, this is not really this doesn't really track to say what an ejection fraction would be, which can be categorical, which is this is really just binary, is either yes or a no. So the most common one is looking at volumes, okay? And this is called the modified Simpsons method, okay? Assuming that the LV is an ellipse, okay? Where you see, a, again, a bunch of disks, okay? So you do two dimensions, what's called orthogonal or 90 degree planes. This is an apical four chamber and two chamber. So this allows you to kind of reconstitute what's essentially a cone, okay, with disks. Um, and this is done with lots of different software. This is being done more in automated fashion now. Um, 
But interestingly, uh, despite this technique, it is still very, very common for uh, echo labs to use visual ejection fraction. Just to look at an EF and say, you know, normal, abnormal, high, low, very low. So it is, um, this technique is the one that's most commonly used by the echo technicians to eject, assess ejection fraction. But when the cardiologists read that, there may not always be a symptoms method. In some cases, it's just a visual ejection fraction. So again, this just shows you kind of the, looking at kind of the length and diameter of the different discs. And this is the big, the big assumption here is this is an ellipsoid shape. Um, there actually is modest reproducibility, okay? Not, not high reproducibility, because the issue is that the exact imaging planes can be difficult to recapture. So if you do symptoms of methanol on one patient at time A, and then do it 24 hours later, and there's a 10% difference in ejection fraction, it may not actually be different. In fact, within the ECHO guidelines, it suggests that 10% is probably on the border that's unlikely to be emblematic of true EF change. It's probably just literally it was remeasured. Okay, and that's because of just the shape of the LV, the exact section, how you're tracing the endocardium. Okay, so this is the endocardium here. Okay, so you can see why EF may not be as, as specific as we hope. They kind of... See that all the time. Yeah. To 35. Exactly. Yeah, a hundred percent. So you know, we're often relying on these very specific numbers, but but that is the problem. Is is they're they're picking where they trace, picking when they trace, like are they picking at, at the true end of systole or true end of diastole, or they're picking slightly before that, and then which exact imaging plane are they using? So as, as time has gone on, it's kind of evolved towards a more 3D ejection fraction, okay? So um, newer, you know, higher quality, frankly, way more expensive machines can do 3D volumes, okay? These are big, fancy probes that can do 3D volumetric calculations. Uh, it's more reproducible, more expensive. In fact, lower spatial and temporal resolution than 2D. Um, and, you know, MRIs to actually... Your, technically your gold standard now in terms of doing an EF. Of course, getting an MRI for an EF is, uh, is is not really available in probably most parts of the world. We can do it here for select patients, and I expect cardiology can speak more to this than I can, but I would not say it's an in, in, in in easily accessible standard for ejection fraction. And then, of course, if you're looking to compare that to a future, um, a future change in EF, you'd probably need to repeat it with MRI rather than using echo, right? Because the problem is, is technique dependent, right? Yeah. So, but in ICU, frankly, 2D LVF is probably better for fault assessment in ICU patients. So while 3D EF is really interesting, um, there's lots of benefits. It's also very expensive and not widely accessible. It has its own issues. Now, this is where um, ejection fraction is slowly heading towards is integration of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, where the machine learning algorithm has um, has a large database to operate off of. It can automatically um, draw around the endocardial border, okay, in both and systole and diastole. And many of these algorithms will actually pick the smallest volume and the biggest volume to calculate its EF. And this will do it in an automated fashion. Um, and many of these probes, too, don't require the user to actually pick the sequence the actual algorithm will pick the best sequence. Um, so these, um, there's, I think there's two or three of these now that are available in the market. Um, and studies are, are coming out in terms of comparing these to, uh, to kind of more comprehensive or modified Simpson. So this is, this is definitely um, coming to a place near you and uh, offers some really nice benefits at the bedside. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the 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 Philips machines now, I think, um, in post processing, once you've acquired the images, yeah. you can put them into into the into their software. Uh, it's like the proprietary Philips software, which will do auto auto ejection fractions and yeah. and strain imaging, other kinds of applications. So you're definitely right. There are ways to to actually uh, even post process images that you have. And those those kind of similar algorithms are being used now in, in smaller devices with machine learning just to increase the accessibility 
um, by various different vendors. But what are the limitations to ejection fraction? Well, we've talked about this a bit. Hold on. I, I thought I was clicking on that properly. There we go. So if you go to menti.com on your phone and put in that code, 89521537. You can scan the QR thing too. Sorry. My apologies. That's way easier. My apologies. So what are the EF limitations? We've talked about a couple of them. Feel free to mention those or other ones that you're aware of. Scan the QR code, Adam. <laughs> Please account for Adam Romanowski and his very long responses. Excellent. Yeah. So regurgitation, right? Because of course your your actual um true volume is not reflective of your volume expelled from the ventricle. Operator dependent, yeah, for sure. You know, if you're off axis, not through long axis and left ventricle, and you have poor uh, you have poor resolution of your endocardial borders, okay, then it doesn't matter whether you have eyeballs or have an algorithm, it's still going to be not, it's going to be unreliable. Not equal along the ventricle. Yeah. Yeah. How you slice it. Exactly. And, you know, the actual um, left ventricle, you think about what, what proportion of the ventricle contributes to, to your stroke volume, the base is around two thirds and the apex is around one third. And so when you have uh, particularly things like takotsubos, which is apical um, akinesis, or reverse takotsubos, which is the, the, the opposite, basal, okay, your, your cardiac output can actually be very, can be much worse than you think it would be, would be otherwise, because the apex can, the apex or the base can look more dynamic, but contribute less to the cardiac output. So, and then yes, acute versus chronic. So an acute EF of 20% versus a chronic EF 20% are just not the same. Okay, if if you take a healthy patient with an EF drop twenty percent, you would see cardiogenic shock. Like that's an appreciable drop in EF. But a, a patient who's chronically compensated will not appear the same way. And so when we look at echo, th th that is a huge problem that we deal with in ICU because it's very easy to make attribution errors to a drop in EF or stock to stock dysfunction. Uh, there's also I can't. Uh, oh yes. Exactly. So um, ejection fraction is kind of load dependent and kind of state dependent. So it can change. Okay. So if you have a higher preload or you have lower preload, you know, there is, it is affected by loading conditions. So EF can change. And, you know, we see this all the time where we assess a patient in here and we say the EF is looks, you know, depressed, like 15, 20%. And the next day cardiology comes by and says it's normal. And you're like, well, what do I do with this? Right. Um, so that is the loading conditions, but, um, even with optimal conditions, EF can be incomplete or incorrect estimation of LV function. And this is especially true when there's LVH or, or Hocum with a small cavity size where visually it can look normal. Okay. But there's actually this, uh, significant stock dysfunction and, and a reduced stroke volume. So seeing this heart where the LV is very, very thick. Okay. And you'd be inclined to think that the actual ejection fraction is normal here. Okay, whereas in fact it's actually depressed in this patient. So that's one limitation. Again, we talked about loading conditions, severe MR, for example, in this patient that was referred to this ICU for failure to wean off a ventilator, uh, which pretty profound pulmonary edema whenever you lower the support. Um, you do see a reduced stroke volume tachycardia. That's typically normal, actually, to see that. And then bradycardia, typically uh, you have increased stroke volume okay, as the expected uh, compensation to a low heart rate. And then you have variable filling in R interval with AFib. So it can be very hard to visually look at a ventricle when the, when the filling volumes are actually abnormal or I should say irregular. Bundle branch block uh, is a really another challenging one where basically regional systole and diastole are not simultaneous. So you can see at which part here, if you're doing Simpsons and you're picking systole and diastole, you'd ask yourself, which is which here, right? Like you could imagine that if you take this same heart and ask 10 different people to do Simpsons method, you might have 10 different measurements, right? So that's why bundle branch blocks can be really messy. Um, and you'll kind of get a 
you know, a, a very much like here's the EF ish. Um, so, <laughs> so th th that's one of the problems. And then also in our patients, we always see kind of near normal LV ejection fractions, you know, in high doses of um, pressors and inotropes. And it always leaves you wondering, like, what am I looking at? Like, why is this heart look normal? Is it normal? Like, if you if you feed this heart, which is normal at baseline, gets depressed from you know inflammatory mediators, and then you feed it gasoline to accelerate the fire, and all of a sudden it's normal. Is is that normal? And so it kind of leaves a lot of questions about um, what this means, and also what to do if the patient is critically ill, and you're you know it's three a.m. and you have nothing left to give the patient. So. Yeah. Not necessarily. It's unclear. Like that's truly the answer. It's unclear if they should be hyperdynamic because hyper, being hyperdynamic, um, it probably is, is, I mean, it's secondary to a lot of different things, right? For example, very low afterload. Okay. Having, I mean, having severe MR will make hyperdynamic as well. Um, having a uh, very low preload, for example, like you see in burn patients who are profoundly volume depleted, for example, or hemorrhage, you'll see that. So, you know, it's unclear the exact factors which will contribute to hyperdynamic left ventricular ejection fraction. But as I kind of started this talk out, interestingly, in, in their scup studies showing that elevated EF, like being hyperdynamic, actually increases short-term mortality. Yeah, so it, it's a bit odd. And I think that the truth is we don't really know. Yeah. 100% it may be, yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. But you look at patients with sept and septic shock and you'll see some patients with a normal yeah, and some patients with hyperdynamic. And you'll say like, I, you know, uh, like, are we striving for one of these or should we just, you know, I guess ultimately we're just trying to normalize the pressure, normalize the perfusion, but the heart becomes a bystander in that exercise, right? So um, over time, you know, there's, been this idea that maybe we can look at ejection fraction differently. Like we're we're looking at a cavity. These are gross changes. So this is this gets a bit odd, but I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible. Okay. There are little speckles on the myocardium. Okay. And you can measure how those speckles change. Okay. And, and basically the idea is to have a, a way to measure them without a dimension. Okay. Because the heart, of course, has longitudinal fibers, has circumferential fibers has radial fibers. And the idea is you want to look at how does the heart move overall, okay? And can, can we track it, okay? And this idea very much came to fruition when they realized that in patients who were on uh, kind of cardiotoxic chemotherapeutics, that the strain pattern would actually change well before the ejection fraction would change when patients were at risk of, of cardiotoxicity. And so now it's it's pretty common for echo labs when, for cancer screening to use strain as a standard because strain will be more sensitive for LV dysfunction than ejection fraction is. And so um, thinking about how this works, if you think about uh, imaging from the apex, from an apical four chamber, a negative strain means that the heart is actually, is, is moving, is actually contracting in systole. Okay, like it's getting smaller, the points are getting smaller. Okay, that's a negative strain. Um, and then a positive is, uh, could be considered, if, if you're thinking about, in short axis, it's thickening, okay, um, where the actual LV is thickening. The most common um, way of thinking about this is global longitudinal strain, okay? So in this apical window, where again, shortening is negative. So it kind of seems counterintuitive, but you kind of want to see shortening, right? You don't want to see lengthening. Uh, you want to see shortening. You want to see the heart, basically, the base move towards the apex, so here's an example of looking at the different uh, regions of the heart, okay, and showing different measures of strain, okay? Normally around 18 to 22-ish, okay, would be normal. So you can see around here grossly, most uh, areas are actually contracting fairly well. And if you just ignore the fancy color changes, you can see the LV itself looks pretty normal, okay? So this is what it's just doing. It's just saying length at a given point in time minus baseline length over baseline length. And so if it's if if uh, it's indeed um, going upwards, for example, then it's plus fifty percent. Okay, normal values are around seventeen to twenty three percent. So if thinking of global longitudinal strain, it's negative seventeen to twenty three percent. Okay, because that's of course 
uh, that's that's looking at the steckles getting smaller in distance. So this has actually been shown to have a much better prognostic value um, and a much more sensitive marker of LV systolic function. So it's got prognostic information above LVEF for morbidity and mortality. And so that's just showing the different views. They're, you know, apical four chamber, apical two, apical three. Okay, and this is a map, okay, which is showing how much strain you segment. And these, these are basically um, by region, okay? So you can map out each region and what it's doing for strain. So you can imagine that this is a much more kind of quantifiable way to look at function, okay, or, or detect dysfunction. And this is a what's called a bullseye plot, okay, where we can see all the different uh, levels of strain by each segment, okay? So there's a septum, that's the anterior septum, anterior wall, lateral wall, posterior wall. So these maps um, can help determine or help show you um, kind of from a, you know, 10,000 uh, foot view where the dysfunction is happening. So for example, in some weird cases like cardiac amyloid, where you have preservation of the apex, okay, that's fairly typical. Apical hypertrophy, where you see some you see some uh, involvement of the apex, okay? Septal MI, for example, where you see a drop in strain in the septum. Now, this is much more kind of cardiology oriented. So I don't want people to get the impression that this is what I see you'll be doing in the future, okay? But there is um, some idea that actually in patients with septic shock, despite the fact that they can have a normal EF, okay, in this patient with septic shock, okay, it's EF 54%, they actually have a drop in their global longitudinal strain. And I think, I guess I'm making, I thought this strain would be useful to review to talk about why patients who have normal EFs and septic shock may not actually have normal hearts, okay? When you measure with the different techniques, it's just that we use EF and EF is not sensitive, therefore, you know. But in, in reality, it's we're not sure what to do about it, okay? Sure, you find it, it's prognostically, maybe it's bad, but what do you do about it? And, and that's the real problem with using strain in an ICU patient, for example, versus using it in a, in a cancer care clinic, okay? Sure, you can change the cancer cardiotoxic therapeutics, but in ICU, what does that mean? And so I think we're far off from being able to use strain in, in a more uh, helpful fashion beyond just saying that this looks bad, okay? And we have a lot of tools that say just looks bad, uh, but it, it's much better if we have a tool that says this looks bad and this is what you should do about it. Um, I mean, that's a great question. So interestingly, so um, I'll, I'll talk about this in, in a little bit, but basically um, each each vendor has their own kind of strain software. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> of course they do. Um, but actually, as time goes on, um, like even point of care vendors are realizing that this is a technology that people want, especially for research use. And so it's getting easier. Okay, and so I actually do foresee this as one technology that could be pretty accessible in the next 10 years. Okay, so it's not, um, you know, most of this is done in, in what's called post-processing, where you acquire the images, and then you go in the machine and, you know, beep, bop, bop, beep, beep, and then all of a sudden you get the strain map, which looks all fancy and blah, blah, blah. 100%. Uh, and, that, and that is the problem. You find this thing, and then what do you do about it, right? So, um, for example, there's a patient with cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, for example, this was one of the few parameters that predicted mortality. Um, and so, you know, you could imagine that in this world where maybe this is one thing we can use in patients who have normal EF and in septic shock, where we can predict that actually, in fact, they do have heart dysfunction. It's just that it's not obvious on gross inspection. You need good imaging quality. If you agree in two segments, um, then it's suboptimal. It should be thrown out. Is there any what to do with this? How does it impact management or versatility? And again, different strain packages. And you need about 50 studies to, be pra to practically use this technique. And so, again, I think we're probably a long ways off from employing this technique. But I think from a from like a pure science standpoint, it is fascinating to think that we, we could detect this kind of subclinical dysfunction. So let's talk about Doppler. Um, so obviously, it's one thing to look at a heart and say, this is what it's doing. Okay, and, and that is a, somewhat the problem with EF. It's like, I, I can look, look, this is what it's doing, okay? But you may be more interested to look at the actual output, okay? Now, this is where um, 
it gets a bit murky because technically with some of the more uh, advanced algorithms with uh, machine learning and with 3D, technically you can actually look at a volumetric output, okay? Because it's doing a 3D volume. So now trying to tie in 3D volumes to to say Doppler output to like, you know, Swan GANs, that'll be the future. But um, for now, uh, largely we're using um, Doppler to look at um, stroke volume, for example, and gradients across ventricles. And so we can look at actually what the ventricle is doing, okay? And studies have been done for many, many years comparing Doppler-based cardiac output versus invasive measures of cardiac output and has found fairly strong accuracy. Um, and we'll we'll break that down. The first thing, uh, I won't cover this, I'll cover this very briefly, but basically this is the idea that if fission has much regurgitation, we can use continuously of Doppler to look at how fast, okay, does the rate of pressure rise of mitral regurgitation, okay, during isovolemic contraction. So when the when the ventricle is contracting, okay, but the aortic valve is not open, okay, there's regurge there. So how much does that regurge rise? And we can typically say that a normal um, LV has a rate of rise of greater than 1,200 millimeters per second, and that's going from one meter per second to three meter per second in in reverse. Again, this is the regurgitant jet, okay. So obviously you need to have MR. It needs to be a central MR jet. Uh, if it's e if it's an eccentric jet or off-axis jet, it's likely not reliable. And if you have acute severe mitral regurg, then quite likely you have a high lactitial pressure, and this is not reliable. Again, I I don't think I've certainly never used this. I, I think short of teaching about it, but it's more of a historical technique than anything. Uh, it's not very commonly used. Um, so in 1979, uh, this uh, this scientist Light discovered that you could actually use Doppler to insulate the ascending aorta. So from a, a supersternal notch position, kind of pointed the Doppler and said, "Oh, what's this upstroke thingy that I'm seeing?" Uh, and that, in fact, was the was the output from the ascending aorta. Uh, interestingly, it was actually many many years after that, like 15, 16 years later, before people started saying, "Well, maybe we should use this to calculate cardiac output." And so people started experimenting with um, looking at the right peristernal window, for example, um, the supersternal notch view, the heart, looking at just saying, what is the output like? And is it reliable compared to what we're using? Which was all, frankly, kind of swan GANs, uh, transpulmonary thermodilution methods. So how is this done? So this is called the sample volume of pulse wave Doppler. And it's placed a centimeter from the aortic valve, okay? Or frankly, even at the aortic valve annulus. And what it's measuring here is a, a column of red blood cells traveling during systole, okay? So this is a column of red blood cells, okay? And it's pulsatile flow. So you're seeing, the, you're seeing it go from a low velocity to a peak velocity and down. And what they discovered was that this actually, um, this, this waveform actually represents more than just a velocity. Because um, when you factor in time and velocity, you get a product, you get an integral of the velocity time curve, which actually is much more like a two-dimensional stroke volume. Okay, so that took a while for them to realize that. As you can imagine, if you're just playing with Doppler and saying, look at this waveform, like, look how cool this is. Um, but realizing that, in fact, this represents more than just uh, a fancy uh, Doppler technique and a fancy whoosh. Okay, so, uh, which of course is why I primarily do Doppler is to elicit the whoosh. And the fancy whoosh okay and um so this here in this patient for example it's traced okay so it's an integral air into the curve it's given 17.2 centimeters okay so that's a funny measurement but, but basically is also called the stroke distance okay which factors in the velocities and time across this area and you know so this again this is a two-dimensional stroke volume okay so to make it a three-dimensional stroke volume of course so if we have the column in 2d then we want to draw the cross-sectional area of the um, outflow tract, okay? Because that's where the where the sample volume is placed. That's where to get the measurement. So you go into your personal long axis view, okay, which offers much higher resolution, and you measure roughly where that sample volume was placed, okay? You get a diameter, and then you factor that in, okay, to get a cross-sectional area. Now, you know, we often estimate that the diameter is two centimeters, which mean which means the radius is one centimeter radius one centimeter squared is one so then that's just pi okay so often you can multiply the vti by pi in your brain 
and come up with a fairly close approximation. I mean, there's a large fudge factor there because, of course, whenever you square something, uh, it can have a much greater impact on your cross-sectional area and stroke volume. Now, interestingly, um, VTI alone actually is helpful. So VTI sans cross-sectional area. This is a study that was done in 2001 where they showed that, you know, across body surface areas, a normal VTI is around 20 plus or minus three centimeters. Okay, so that's a normal VTI. At heart rates less than 55, okay, so on this map here, okay, most patients had a VTI less than 22. Okay, or sorry, less uh, had a VTI greater than 18. Okay, and then at heart rate greater than 95, most patients had a VTI less than 22. Okay, so if your VTI is 28 and your heart rate's 110, you're probably more in a high output state. Okay, because typically you do see a drop in your stroke volume when your heart rate goes up. Okay, and you see, and you see a rise in your stroke volume as the heart rate drops. So a VTI um, of around 20 plus or minus three is typically the range. Now there's actually studies uh, looking in patients in, in kind of CICU, CCU, showing that a depressed VTI actually is a better predictor of morbidity and mortality than ejection fraction. Okay, so I, VTI alone is actually a very helpful parameter to be aware of. Okay, so here's a patient with a depressed ejection fraction. Okay, so there it is there. Now I'm going to trace it. I didn't drink coffee this day very deliberately. <laughs> uh, for those who have used this machine, it's uh, you got to be a bit like Picasso to, to draw around these things. Our more recent machines do this in a more automated fashion. Um, so... I, I think I've cut off the VTI measurement. It, once you're done here, it'll pop up on the side, but it was around uh, 13, okay? So this is this is a, just a smaller VTI, and this corresponds to the drop in EF. So the reason why I, I bring this up is because when you use ejection fraction and stroke volume in combination, you actually come up with, with like a much more logical answer to what the heart is doing, okay? Because if your EF is low, okay, and your VTI is low, then you you truly have kind of connected the series of ejection fraction and output, okay? If your ejection fraction is low, but your VTI is normal, probably, okay, the heart is not playing a, a tremendous role in terms of the actual shock state, okay? Most likely. If, you're, if your, uh, you know, ejection fraction is normal, okay, but your VTI is high, like 28, for example, then even though the EF does not look high, it still is high. The, the output is still high. And that is that likely, the issue is this is very much like on the um, kind of the beginner's uh, perspective on understanding how to use EF and VTI. So this is an algorithm that's been proposed, but it's not been, it's not, it's not been prospectively validated. But I expect that in the future, this is much more likely where things will head. And as, as, the, um, as automation takes a foothold in measuring EF and VTIs, I think we'll see a much better perspective on what the heart is doing and what to do about it. Um, so limitations, you got to measure VTI, same point as PW Doppler capture. You got to make sure your angle of incination is less than 20 degrees to your flow. If you have atrial fibrillation, you got to take five measurements and average them. Okay, that's a problem and exclude PVCs. Um, unreliable if you have a shunt or severe atic regurgitation. And then again, if you have a really high heart rate, you're like 130, 140, 150 probably less clear as to what, what's really going on. And if you have dynamic and fixed obstruction, it, it, it's not reliable. So if you have systolic anterior motion, if you have aortic stenosis, it's not going to be that reliable. Okay, any questions on that stuff so far? Uh, it's, it's probably, that's a really challenging question to, to answer. Um, so if they have moderate AS, I, I think it just depends on what state you're dealing with, right? Like if you're dealing with a profound drop in afterload, like th that's, that's going to be an issue, right? Cause for, they have to perfuse their coronaries because the coronaries of course are post valvular. Um, so it, it really does depend on what, what the clinical scenario kind of demands, because if it truly is a drop in in their afterload, they need to raise their afterload, right? And just like intubating a patient who, uh, with you know a fixed obstruction, it's the same kind of concerns. Um, 
So if you if you increase their inotropy, for example, uh, I think it'd be difficult to say whether there's truly been a change in their output, but you you could measure it technically. You could do a serial VTI. And the thing about a serial VTI is you don't need to remeasure the LVOT because, right? right? Yeah. In fact, you don't need to measure the LVOT at all. You could just measure a VTI baseline and measure a VTI and repeat because that's it's really just the percentage change that that you're going to be looking at. So you could, and then measure your, uh, you know, measure your blood pressure, heart rate, and, and markers of perfusion and what have you. So it's a bit more challenging to exactly answer to that question because it depends on what kind of state you're dealing with. So this is a 52-year-old female, profound septic shock. Okay, so you're at the bedside. She is on 0.5 nor epi. She's on 0.2 epi. Actually, no epi, just 0.5 nor epi. Hey, Vince. This is the short axis. Okay, so again, person long axis. Okay, so for those, the uninitiated left atrium, left ventricle, or VOT, that's the aortic valve. Okay, that's the anteroseptum. That's the uh, infralateral wall. Okay. So you can see here, the cavity is fairly big. Okay. Here's the short axis. Okay. Let you guys sit with that a second. And here's the apical four chamber. Oh. Okay, here's the VTI. It's 10. So what would you suggest as an intervention? Uh, so yeah, this patient, depressed LV function in sinus rhythm with very low VTI. So I would argue you could trial inotropes. Okay, as your next intervention, obviously, this does not look like a profoundly volume deplete ventricle. Um, there is some dysfunction. It's hard to know whether you would get a clinical response. Okay, and that obviously you can measure, you can measure your typical parameters of perfusion if, or your, you know, vitals, for example, blood pressure, heart rate. You look at um, centrifugal saturations and lactate, but it really is hard. Now, I suppose it's possible that in the future, you could argue that if you had strain, for example, available, maybe you could look at strain as a marker to see if there's an appreciable change in the, in your, in your ventricle. Okay. Just because ejection fraction alone um, may be hard to do, right? Like if you have a change of ejection fraction of 5%, like I just told you, the problem with ejection fraction is there's a lot of problems with it. Okay. As a marker. So maybe strain is one way you can look at is an appreciable change. Okay. And does that change lead to clinical consequences? That, that would be an unanswered question. Yes. If you don't see any rotation, then perhaps either you have to impact in different stages for sure. Or perhaps that impact is irrelevant. Yep. And I mean, some patients you'll see, like, you know, we I remember we had an 83 year old with, with COVID who, frankly, didn't really have, have, have like COVID. He probably just had like pneumonia. And so he got intubated, of course. And, you know, there was much to do about his low heart function. And he got placed on some tobutamine. And that guy's heart went from like an 80 year old to like a 30 year old. So like it was <laughs> like, like visibly this guy, this guy's heart looked amazing. Okay. And he came right off norepinephrine and was extubated two days later. And it really wasn't an issue. And the problem is we don't really know, um, like, yes, there's a clinical response. I totally agree. You could also argue that some patients may not necessarily benefit and may in fact be harmed, for example, things like epinephrine. Uh, so it's hard to know. Um, but my feeling is there are some hearts where the myocardium is very, very thin. It's clearly a chronic cardiomyopathy that adding epinephrine, all it's going to do is increase the afterload. So I suppose the it would be nice if there was a way for us to look at hearts and say, did this drug help? Did it do nothing? Uh, or did it harm? And I, I think that would be, in my mind, uh, a really interesting way to look at heart function. 62-year-old male with refractory undifferentiated shock. Okay, so this is a personal axis, of course, not, not a terribly high quality one, just fine. Left atrium, left ventricle, lots of calcium here okay, on the mitral valve. Here's the aortic valve, here's the aortic root, it's a bit cut off, and the RVOT. Okay, so that's the first image. Second image, that's a short axis. 
and this is the final image. Okay, so that's that's what you have first. Now I'm going to show you the VTI. Okay, 31.4. What is the next best therapy for this patient? The correct answer here. Okay, so this this actually is um, pretty unclear, but this is hyperdynamic. Okay, the, the LV itself, we can tell, is, looks grossly normal, like there's no regional dysfunctional. Region, you know, it's either normal or hyperdynamic. It's one of those sides. With the VTI, it pushes more to the hyperdynamic range. So I expect likely more high output with low afterload. Um, and so this is the kind of robust response to low afterload. You know, should you add inotropy? I don't think it will necessarily help. Okay. And, and in fact, it actually may make things worse. Um, when also when you look at hearts, when you get more um, skill in, in evaluating um, the, the structure of hearts, occasionally you'll see, for example, thick bulky septums, you'll see risk factors for what would be deterioration with inotropy. Okay. So in some cases, for example, maybe they have some baseline systolic anterior motion already. Okay, where the mitral valve is being pulled into the LVOT and starting anotrope will actually lead to immediate deterioration. Um, so in this case, given it's a high VTI and again refractory shock, I'd be more inclined to think this is probably an afterload problem. Okay. I don't, you know, I can't say with like 100 percent evidence behind me. I think that giving IV fluids is probably what would happen as well, to be honest. It might depend on how much fluids they've received already and a variety of states. So I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, but I suspect that probably the issue here is just a very low afterload. So case three. <laughs> Molar pregnancy. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on here, right? Okay, so that's the person long axis. Okay, so we see left atrium here. This is the left ventricle. That's the LV. Air guffle track, air valve, RVOT, a bit of a pericardial effusion, nothing, nothing crazy on this view. Okay, here's a short axis. Looks crazy to you, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we don't see much cavity left here at end systole. Okay, and someone's made a measurement. They felt this was important. <laughs> What's that, sorry? Yeah, on a live image, yeah, yeah. Really, really high quality measurement here. Um, I'm joking, obviously, uh, typically you, you should freeze an image in the right phase of, uh, the cardiac cycle to make a measurement, but someone decided here that that was less important. <laughs> okay. So that's the apical four chamber. Okay. Now here is, here is the measurements. Now th this is our more recent machines can do some automated fashion. So if you calculate a LV2 diameter in a person long axis, and then you uh, type in a cardiac output, it will automatically give you uh, drawings, drawings of all the uh, stroke volumes. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Um, so this is the, the newer machine we have, Sonoslight machine that we have that has drawn these BTIs, okay? And it gives you the option of whether accepting or refuting. So I just accepted all of them, okay? You can, but you can see here how these differences impact the measurement of cardiac output. So it will do it. You just say, yeah, it'll, VTI, it'll do all the magic. Yeah, it's a yep. manual trade. And it'll take the heart rate off the Yep. Oh. Yeah. So this is this is really easy to do, and it's only getting easier with every iteration of the machine we have. Um, so it's showing that your stroke volume based off uh, cross-sectional area, pi r squared from your uh, radius measurement, okay, and giving a VTI. And then, you know, you can factor this into body surface area if you're so inclined, but, you know, you could argue that this appears to be normal, obviously, across uh, a variety of range. Now, your VTI here is kind of within the normal range, so I don't think this appears to be uh, like a high output state. Okay, then, so the question is, is, uh, you know, what do you do with this? Well, again, you can try fluids and presses may be reasonable for uh, hemodynamic support. Um, if you give this patient more pressors, I or sorry, more inotropy, I would be worried that you could cause issues as well, okay? Um, this idea that you can actually take a ventricle, okay? People often think that the LV is like a bag. There's like an inlet and outlet. It's almost like a, it's almost like bagpipes. <laughs> one goes in here and it goes out there and it's one big bag that squeezes, right? But it's more of a, it's more of a series, okay? So you can actually have part of the LV cavity that squeezes so hard that blood can't get from left atrium Okay, to the or uh, from the base of the uh, LV 
to the actual aortic valve without passing through a very tight um, portion of the cavity. It's called mid cavitary obstruction, which if you have a pumping ventricle, you have low volume, you have low afterload, you have high anotropy, your risk of uh, causing obstruction with pressors is actually re is reasonable. And so that's why um, I think when we use anotropy without doing the echo, I think you know, we bit of, I think we do a disservice. I think I think we should be looking at the heart when you're using inotropes because there is a risk that we can make them worse. Of course. I had a burn patient here just a few months ago with like a huge, like 80% burn. And uh, the patient had had 18 liters in emerge, but of course arrived with a hemoglobin of 230 after a 10 hour transfer. And so after they're about 25 liters in, uh, which obviously was not ideal, they were still on, you know, 0.4 norepi and, and 0.2 norepi. And so, you know, going back and forth with the burn surgeon, it was like, look, there's too much fluid. We got to stop it here. We got to stop it. The moment you stop the fluid, okay, the very moment you stop giving this person fluid, their norepi is 0.6, their epi is 0.6, and they're going to arrest. And that was over and over again. Yes. A hundred percent. Very high volume, you know, weird outcome versus they will actually die. Yes. People lose quite a lot of ambulance. For sure. So we, we, I, I had a TE in this patient and showed the burn surgeon that the patient was obstructing on epi. Like they, they couldn't pass blood through their ventricle because we had stopped the IV fluids. And then it was like, oh, I see. So we just can't stop. And I said, no, we just can't stop. And I agree there's harm, but we literally can't stop because you will arrest. Yeah. Exactly. So anyways, other things to watch out for, this is just what I was talking about. Just be careful. People will see a, a hyperdynamic EF and be like, oh, it's reassuring. It's normal. Okay. Whereas in this case, actually blood can't escape the ventricle. Okay. Because there's actually uh, systolic anterior motion. It's pretty small there. Okay. But uh, this just shows how fast the blood is trying to escape. Yes. Yeah. So I'll often will go on the machine and then go under review and then I'll manually drag the cine function. So I can see, because it's very, very fast, okay? But again, this is a small image. But the point here is just be leery of hyperdynamic ejection fraction, because it can be very bad, okay? It can tell you that, in fact, they either got a mid cavitary gradient where they're obstructing in their heart or obstructing in the alpha tract. I have not, not in this talk. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 the rate of rise is is actually like rather than being linear is actually exponential okay. because the obstruction is getting worse as you go towards the end of systole. Like it's not fixed. It's getting smaller. That's why the velocity is getting even faster. Like there's acceleration on the acceleration. Yeah. So anyways, that was a review of left heart function. Uh, we talked about a variety of methods from linear to more um, to 2D to 3D measures of ejection fraction to a bit of strain, which I get, I get, you know, get, gets a bit wonky on the ultrasound, you know, perspective, but I think it helps give you some, information on what are some more advanced techniques that help us truly demonstrate pathology without seeing pure changes in EF. And we talked about a bunch of cases where we can integrate um, EF and stroke volume. So obviously, um, you know, left center function plays an important role in managing our patients. There's many ways to assess it. Historically, focused, focused a lot on structural assessment of the LV cavity. You know, I think um, we've also focused on using invasive measures for credit output, and as time has gone on, less invasive measures um, and I, I do think that the future of looking at the heart, especially in ICU patients, will incorporate these more output measures of function. That way we can better classify patients who will, you know, either respond or not respond to various different therapies. So that's all I had. So thank thanks everyone for attending. I hope you enjoyed that. And that's all I have. Yeah. Is there anybody else? Yeah, there was a bunch. Uh, Liz is there and Jay is there. And there's, there was Jim, there was Rex. Watch your thing, yeah.
Is there any questions? Feel free. Uh, 